Well, good morning. Oh, thank you. That's good. Good response. Um, yeah, I just feel a little bit sad today. Um, happy, but happy sad. You know, when a, when a saint goes to heaven, they're going to stand today in, in Fran. A couple of years ago, um, as I started to preach a little more, I learned that the, the pre-prayer before a sermon is called prayer of illumination. I didn't know that, but I like it. Before we pray and ask God to help us, I just find that significant, that, it, that we're asking God to show us something. Because we're human, right? We're, we sometimes get confused. We sometimes find ourselves in dark, in darkness. But as we ponder God's word and share God's word, things become a little more together. Things become a little more brighter. So let us pray a prayer of illumination. God of justice, peace and righteousness, come into our midst this morning. Breathe your breath, your spirit of prophecy, your energy, your enlivening, your imagination on us. Wake us up, open our eyes, Unplug our ears that we might hear, that we might see, that we might grieve. That we might dream, that we might follow the ways of your extraordinary kingdom. Amen. I came across this CBC article online a while back. It's called Life, Death, and Being a Man in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Just a little trigger warning. This story involves um, self-harm and suicide. Brandon Niwa spent his second last day alive, like he did so many others, operating a crane. This particular job involved moving a fridge. It was a small task by Niwa Crane Standards, founded by his father in 1977. The family business had literally built much of Medicine Hat over the past 43 years. Among the many structures they've helped erect is the world's largest teepee one of the most recognizable landmarks in the city of 65,000 people in southeastern Alberta. But the, the fridge job was nothing like that. It was more of a family chore. Brandon used a small crane to move the appliance to the pool house at his father's home, which overlooks the picturesque Bull Head Creek Valley at the eastern edge of town. Greg Neewa said nothing seemed out of the ordinary about his son that day. He was maybe a little agitated, but often he got that way when he had to do a job that wasn't particularly challenging or profitable. As a child, Brandon was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactive hyperactivity disorder. When his parents were to turn their backs or even for even a moment, he was known to climb into an alarming height, up a street light, or the brick facade of a grocery store. That daredevil, was, that daredevil, daredevil nature was common in his group of friends. But Brandon got ADHD under control as an adult by meticulously planning out his tasks and executing them step by step. In all his years of operating cranes, he had never had an accident. The plan was for Braden to take over, or Brandon rather, take over a Niwa crane one day soon. After the fridge was installed, Brandon said goodbye to his father and went home. The next day, he took his own life. The shock of this death 
reverberated through family, friends, Braden's learned network, network of social circles, and medicine had itself. But what came next left people in the small city absolutely reeling. There was another suicide among the same group of friends. And then another, and another. All men in their 30s and early 40s. There had been so many deaths over the past few months, it's hard to keep track. The mayor of Medicine Hat trying to do, try to do the grim tabulation. Had to count out loud. Five, six, seven young men. It depends to a degree on how social circles are defined. Another friend in the group didn't die by suicide, but those who knew him said there were complications from addiction related to his death. There have been many attempted suicides as well. Normally these types of things are rarely discussed in public. As much as the stigma around mental health has eroded in recent years, a reticence around suicide in particular remains. And this often goes double for men. There's still a strong masculine culture of stoicism, of shouldering burdens alone, of suffering in silence. That was especially true among this group of friends who grew up in a traditional man's man's fashion. They played hockey, rode dirt bikes, and snowboarded together. They partied hard. As one member of the group put it, heart-to-heart -heart conversations were dreaded and rare, and when they did happen, it was usually in the wee hours of the morning, after many drinks. But in wake of so much death, things started to change. Friends and family are opening up about their lost loved ones. And some guys are starting to talk remarkably openly about their own struggles. Attitude about what, ha what, what it means to be a man are shifting. A community conversation is starting. This story is difficult to hear, to understand, and to fathom. And the story unfolded not too long ago. This article was written in 2020. And it's not too far away. In a similar, in a city, different, bigger, but similar culture to ours, I suppose. I don't share this story to be dramatic or to be an alarmist. It's not our story. It's, it's their story. But I think it serves a lesson to us. This story hits close to home for me and I bet for some of you. I went through a very dark and confusing time in my early 20s. I was a Christian, but I was depressed, anxious, and suicidal. But God in his grace helped me to navigate that. And I'm here today as a testimony. My cousin took his own life at 21 when I was 19. It rocked my world. I really loved him. He was from the nice part of town, too. He was tall, smart, artistic, handsome, athletic, and popular. Valedictorian of his graduating class. Two years before his death, he did a whole year in Switzerland and did grade 12 over again for the cultural experience.
my talk today, it's not about suicide. It's not about death. It's actually about life. An invitation to something deeper, something bigger. It's about a relationship and a purpose. It's about men in our community, and it's about the brothers in our churches. I come to you this morning with my men's leader hat on. I just wanted to have a heart-to-heart today to the guys here. This may seem odd, considering we're in a mixed crowd this morning. And it's not Father's Day. It's not a men's retreat. But it was heavy on my heart to do this. And and the way we live and behave as men, as brothers, hugely affects the women and children in our lives and in our world. So I think this conversation, this work that we're trying to do at Foursquare, really matters to everybody. And I want to take a moment, actually, to acknowledge the incredible ladies and sisters we have in this church. You're mature, you're gifted, and you're talented. And I'm so glad we're in a church where there's no glass ceiling for you up here. You can lead, you can teach, and you can pastor, just like me. Some of you are in the deep of cluster feeds, mustard-stained pampers, and sleep deprivation. However, it's a season, and it's all part of the process of shaping and forming your faith and ministry. I recall a friend of mine in California posting um, a quote or a challenge. She was a leader in a mission, but it was challenging Senior pastors, senior pastor women, is it possible? Is they, can they, do they have the ability to protect and to lead and shepherd a church? And her response was, have you ever tried to take a baby cub from a mama bear? Mic drop, right? We have a lot of mama bears in this church. And I think that's awesome. But I also want to say... A few things this morning, too. A few stories to our our ladies today. I'm sorry if you've ever had to do it alone because a man walked away from you. I'm sorry if you've ever had to stand alone because no man would stand with you. I'm sorry if you ever suffered because of a man's negligence and passivity. And I'm sorry if you've ever suffered from trauma because of a man's violence and aggression. That, that's not okay. We live in a hurting world and hurting people hurt people. The statistics on men are bleak. Men's suicides are three times higher than women's. Men commit the most horrendous crimes compared to women. And when, women, when men don't step up in the home and father their children, it just creates a whole bunch of other statistics. However, God loves his sons so much that he sent his beloved son to save and set them free. God wants to take all that aggression and testosterone, all those wounds, all the hurt, all the trauma, all the fatherlessness and the loneliness and all the misdirected passion and all the hyperactivity. He wants to redeem it, heal it, and use it for his good. Several months ago, maybe it was a year ago now, Francine attended the ladies' conference here. I think it was called e-conference or something. Well, she came home all riled up. She was saying, God's going to use women. 
to start a movement. She was ready to sell the house and move to Syria. And I chuckled to myself because I was doing some deep dive into men's work and men's ministry and strategy. And now a lot of the men's writers are saying, well, if men get it, everybody's going to get it. And I was trying to chuckle to myself. I thought, wouldn't it be great if we just all got it? Amen? There's a prophecy in Joel that says this. Joel 2. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Everybody gets it. In Acts 2, in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came on everybody at Pentecost, Paul reminded them of that prophecy and said, this is just the beginning of that prophecy spoken in Joel. And again, he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. A few months ago, I woke up with the phrase run in my head. Running used to be one of my favorite pastimes. Um, and best, favorite ways to stay active. But not lately. And I'm trying to get back into it. But it reminded me of one of my favorite verses. And I hadn't thought about it in a while. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the right hand of the throne of God. He considered him who endured such oppression from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us run with perseverance. The line that kept running through my head after I woke up that morning. I, I think the scripture really helps me frame the conversation I wanted to have this morning. The writer of Hebrews wants to encourage the early Christians to stay strong and finish strong. Things were pretty tough back then for early Christians, especially Hebrew Christians for what this letter was written to. They were like doubly persecuted because they were Jewish and because they were Christian. And they were scattered. However, the message applies for us today as well. We have different challenges. And specifically, as men. There are two things that stick out to me in this message, in this passage. Two things that I think will help us as we think about persevering in our faith and going on this journey and finishing well. The two points were, throw off anything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And the second, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Going back to the first point, there's a lot we can say about that. But I want to zoom in on that phrase, throw off anything that hinders. That takes me back to that story that we were reading at the beginning of this conversation. I just want to highlight that. It stuck out to me.
There is still a strong masculine culture of stoicism, of shouldering burdens alone, of suffering in silence. They partied hard, and as one member of the group put it, heart-to-heart -heart conversations were dreaded and rare. And when they did happen, it was usually in the wee hours of the morning after many drinks. See, that comment is an issue. What they are talking about there is what I would call a hindrance that needs to be thrown off. Us as men and off our culture. And perhaps even in the church a little bit. It's because it's a cultural thing. It's not a Jesus thing. And to make it a little bit worse, if we don't throw that off, it holds us back from really maybe handling our, and dealing with our sin. Which was the second part of that point. Throwing off the hindrances and dealing with our sin. That entangles us. Pay attention to that word entangle. It's not easy to get out of a tangle. It's my understanding that the gospel, Jesus, invites men, all of us, to step into vulnerability, transparency. He wants us to go deeper with him, with our community, with our wives, his men, and our brothers. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Paul also reminds us going to point two, to fix our eyes on Jesus. And so much can be said about that. But from what I understand, it means to learn about Jesus, to meditate on Jesus, and to model Jesus' actions. Jason Wilson talks about this idea of a comprehensive man. Jason Wilson runs a nonprofit in, I believe, Chicago or Boston that empowers young African American children, boys specifically, and men. You might have seen some of his videos go viral on Facebook. One of the videos that, was, that went really viral and made, maybe got him well known was uh, a little boy is trying to punch the wood and he's scared and he starts to cry. And, and Jason Wilson comes up to him and says, Hey, it's okay to bro cry, bro, but you've got to push with the pain, right? Jason Wilson talks about the comprehensive man, as in, it's a man that he's strong, but he's sensitive. He's confrontational when he needs to be, but loving when he needs to be. He knows how to be a, a father to give tough love. He knows when to give soft love, and to show compassion and forgiveness. In some of his articles, he writes about how Jesus was a comprehensive man. Remember how he dealt with the woman at the well and how he dealt with the woman caught in adultery. But then remember how he dealt with the Pharisees and when people were doing business in the temple of prayer. He got aggressive. We all love that story. We just throw at the table. It's nice to know that Jesus got mad once in a while. In Revelation, there's this prophetic picture of Jesus and he, he's, and he, and he represents, uh, the, the picture shows Jesus as a lamb, but also a lion. Jesus was a comprehensive man. So as we fix our eyes on him, may we become like him. Last week, I, I tried to play a little bit of journalist, journalism. I called the first church that came up on Google in Medicine Hat, because I wanted to know more. Not about the story. I, I, the, 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 the article gave me enough details. I wasn't trying to nose around. But I wanted to know how things did change and how the church responded. And so I talked to this guy named Pastor Jamie. He was like the community pastor, I believe, at Hillcrest Alliance in Medicine Hat. And he concurred that things did change. There was actually a gentleman in their church who was friends with some of these, several of these guys that died. And how the church came around him 
supported him and loved him. And how people were super attentive and diligent to be checking on each other. He also reminded me of a, of a scripture. Because he, he does the men's ministry in his church, actually. Remind me of that, that scripture in Peter. 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be alert and sober mind. A sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He said, Jody, sometimes guys just like just go out on their own. And if that was in a jungle or a, a forest somewhere, and a, an animal leaves his, his, his uh, group, what's the word, herd, what do you think is going to happen? The predator is going to be right on him. He said, and that's because what it's like sometimes in the spiritual, in the spiritual environment, the spiritual climate. Men just kind of do their own thing, isolate themselves. They're going to handle themselves, and it doesn't usually end well. He encouraged me to give this guy um, named Ryan a call. Ryan started a nonprofit in, in town out of this out of this this crisis in, in Medicine Hat. Him and two buddies started a nonprofit called um, Our Collective Journey, where they do groups for men, offer counseling, hot, uh, hotlines so people can call and, and be not discreet. Ryan had a history of drug use. Ryan started using drugs maybe in, 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 in high school. He was involved with sports. He got into construction, and then he got into the oil rigs, worked his way up that ladder, became a manager. He said, Jody, I had, I had everything. I had a nice house. I had all the toys, but I still didn't have, I, hadn't, I was missing something. The drug use got worse, and eventually I just wanted to end my life. I became suicidal and attempted a few times. I, I got signed up for a a 12-step recovery group, and that's when I started to realize, oh, I, I, that, that, that gap, that hole, I'm missing a higher power. And then after four years, he made the connection from higher power, oh, God, Jesus, church, oh, cool, and he became a Christian. So the time I, had met, I was talking to him, he'd been a Christian for two years and attending Hillcrest Alliance. The other buddies that joined him and started his own prophet Similar, very, same, very similar stories. And he said to me, a couple things he said to me that stuck out. That when you start to become transparent, when you step into a group, to community, it starts to change you. Things start to come to the surface. And you start to heal. And you start to find purpose. He said, you start to find purpose. So my purpose right now is to normalize this idea that you can, you can share, you can be free, you can be real, you can be open, that a guy, you can take your mask off and ask for help. So my brothers, I singled you out a bit today, but I hope you didn't feel ashamed or attacked. I, felt, I hope you felt hopeful and invited to something, deep, and some, invited to something deeper. I hope you can take a, maybe a bit of a step back, see the bigger picture, and the importance of throwing those things off that hold you back from your real self, from having a full deep life, a full, deep relationship with God, your wife, and your friends. If I was sitting there this morning, a few years ago, listening to this dialogue or conversation, I might have gotten a bit resentful, actually, to be honest. Because I've been sitting there a few years ago, I would have been tired, very tired, overwhelmed, 
with everything? And the thought of trying to figure this all out would have been maybe just too much. My plate was full. Family life, work life, and my own stuff. But I would have been missing the point, wouldn't I? And I was missing the point, I think, back then. I guess if you hear anything else this morning, maybe hear this. I hope it maybe will speak to you. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to carry it alone. You are not weird. You're not the only one with problems. You're not the only one with bad feelings, bad thoughts, and bad memories. You're not the only one with addictions. You're not weak. I'll say it again. You don't have to do it alone. Is there a picture up there? Let me just take a, a moment and look at that piece of art. I want to just read the explanation from the artist. For this picture, I try to emphasize a single element from the text above, referring to Hebrews 12. Namely, the author's call for an undivided focus on the risen Christ as the means and motive for our endurance in this life. As such, the entire image centers and radiates from the form of the resurrected and victorious Lord. In Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, we are called to look to Christ not only as the wellspring of our eternal hope, which is implied, but also because he endured the cross and so sat down at the right hand of the Father in the same way we are called to endure whatever sufferings the path of obedience might entail as we journey onward toward the prize of our master and his own gladness. Because of this, I represented Christ as holding the cross up before his face between himself and the saint. Notice you're called a saint. Whether in great ways or small, our pursuit of Christ will entail sharing with him in his suffering. Romans 8, Hebrews 13. That is the way of the cross, through suffering into glory, through sorrow into joy, through striving into rest, a glory, a joy, and a rest so great that they swallow all proceeding hardships into themselves. I pictured the saint in mid-stride, ferociously tearing away from those clinging tendrils of sin and whatever else might hamper his journey. Coincidentally, it's a man this morning. In order to emphasize the zealous pursuit that Hebrew calls for. And this is key. Remember, you don't have to do it alone. We don't have to do this alone. However, I want to be clear that this race is not and cannot be run on your own strength. Notice that the runner is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Pictured as a fiery dove. You see the dove? It's kind of abstract. Only by the power and working of the indwelling Spirit are we able to overcome sin in our lives? I hope that's good news for some of you today. 
And only in the Spirit can we choose Christ. Only in the Spirit can we choose Christ over sinful desires of the old nature. Yes, we must lay aside every weight and sin and run with endurance as we look to Christ. But we can only do this by the grace of God in the power of the Holy Spirit and may he give us and grant us to do so, so more. Let me read that again. May he give us grace to do so more and more. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for for truth. Thank you for community. Thank you for friends. Thank you for Jesus who shows us the way. And the Holy Spirit that will help us get there. I pray if anybody needs to throw away things today, that you'll give them the courage to do that. And if anybody needs to be real with a friend today or their wife or whoever, I pray you give them the courage to take off the mask and share what's really going on. Lord, be with us as as we grieve a loss of our own family member today. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us strength and energy. as We go about our day today. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen.